Folks, coming on, coming on in, I'm going to start our prelude this morning. It also serves as our minute for mission as it talks about the Presbyterian Women's Birthday Offering. So we'll put that on up while folks are gathering um, and then uh, be back to start our worship in just a moment. Worship with Fox Valley Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're here this morning, uh, wherever you are at home, uh, locally or, or from far beyond. We're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. 
That video that we showed as you were coming in is a video about the Presbyterian Women's Thank or Birthday Offering. Sorry, um, it's one of the two special offerings that Presbyterian women across the country collect each year for a variety of ministries and missions. Uh, the video highlighted those who will be uh, the recipients uh, this year. Um, if you it showed at the end how to donate through the Presbyterian Women's website, we have a way to do that through our own website as well. If you go through the church page, foxvalleypres.org, um, and then hit the give button, it's one of the drop down options uh, for the next week or so. So you are welcome to uh, participate in that special offering uh, through our website if, if you'd like. Have a couple of announcements of things going on in the life of the church. Um, one of them is a uh, exciting new uh, way to provide opportunities for prayer in our community. Um, the uh, church has started a, essentially a prayer chain for the congregation and community. It's outside of our building in, in the front yard and hanging from some of the trees tied to some ropes. The instructions and supplies for participating in the prayer chain and the prayer tree are in the little free library sharing space with some of the books in there and so we encourage you to stop on by the church when you have a chance uh, practice some safe social distancing while you're there if there are others around and add your prayers uh, for those around the world who are impacted by the COVID-19 virus um, feel free to share this opportunity with your friends in the community neighbors others who might want to join in this larger prayer effort um, and it'll be a wonderful way to spread the word and uh, bear witness to God's love in our community. On Tuesday, I believe, there'll be a big banner out there to draw attention to it and to invite folks in. Um, but you're welcome to uh, get started even before then if you have uh, the chance and the ability to be outside um, in the next couple of days. Have a couple of uh, announcements about folks who are in need of our prayers. Uh, Charlie Kallstrom uh, has been hospitalized and is waiting for MRI results, and so we want to hold him and Bobby in our prayer. Um, and the Call family, Jim, Jenny, and Morgan, um, were all in a single car accident this weekend that has um, them hospitalized and waiting for likely surgeries uh, for uh, a number of broken bones. Um, and so we want to hold that family in our prayers. Those are our announcements, so let us continue as we call to worship together. The Holy One, the creator of life, calls us into this day. The Redeemer of all, the still living God, offers us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, we are surprised by the breath of the Spirit. In difficult times, God fills us with the spirit of life, compassion, and peace. May we be filled as we offer our worship today.
This season in which we find ourselves is heavy with loss. Loss of things hoped for and long awaited. Loss of companionship, loss of connection. And yet even in the midst of it all, we know God as the giver of life. Holding the reality of what we grieve in one hand and the promise of renewal in the other, let us confess our reluctance to trust God's promises and follow Christ in faith. God of hope, our grief is real, as is our exhaustion. We miss our friends and family, our familiar routines, and knowing what to expect. We confess that sometimes we overlook the signs of life that you leave all around us. Sometimes we even purposely ignore the new directions in which you are leading us because they don't look like what we're used to. Forgive our denial of new life, our destruction of its hopes, our distorting of possibilities. Fill us with your spirit of life that we might be people of life, servants of life, encouragers of life, and signs of Christ, who is the life of the world. In his name we pray. Amen. God hears the confession of our hearts and lips. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven all our sins. By the Holy Spirit, we are empowered for new life. Amen. And so for our children's message today, we are going to continue on with our theme of signs and messages, lyrics and verses of hope. And so I had a few other shares this week from folks. I'd like to share those with you right now, too. So Brock and Ruth and Cindy said this a couple weeks ago. We missed it. But they made May baskets and Dora dropped them at friends' homes. And it's a childhood tradition to leave baskets with treats and flowers on friends' doorsteps and then run away. It's first ding dong ditch, I guess. It's always done on May 1st. And since we, all we do is drop and run, it seemed like a good time to revive this tradition. Uh, another from Jerry Reed, uh, for the past 27 seasons since we moved into our home, these resurrection lilies have emerged each spring. After the foliage dies in the summer, beautiful pink lily shaped flowers bloom in August. They are a sign to me of better things to come. And then there's this uh, verse of hope from Maryland Church. She says that Romans 15, 13 is her favorite Bible verse. 
The whole verse says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've shared many times my favorite Bible story, but I'd like to share with you one of my favorite uh, verses of a song. It's a song called Swim by Jack's Mannequin. Uh, and it's a whole song about the lead singer of this band uh, fighting and surviving cancer. And uh, one of my favorite lyrics is, the currents will pull you away from your love, just keep your head above. And so we keep on swimming through whatever season of life we are in. And so I'd invite you, if you're in your families or you're at home alone, to uh, share your favorite lyrics and verses of hope with your family, or send it in a text or an email to a friend who may need a little extra inspiration this week. Um, as we share those things, uh, we all need a little signs of hope during this time. Um, but let us come together in prayer. So let us pray together. Oh, oh, sorry, one more from Pastor Stephanie. She says that her Psalm of Hope, Psalm 121, verse 2, my help come from the, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Just seeing that in the chat right now. So another great verse of hope. But now let us come together in prayer. Lord, you are the maker of heaven and earth and the bringer of all hope. Help us to hang on to that hope in this time. And not just to hang on to that hope, but share that hope with others whether it's through sharing a little joy with May baskets, seeing the flowers that pop up each year, or it's finding a song or a favorite Bible verse to share with one another. Help us to be harbingers of hope in this season. All this we pray in your name. Amen. This morning, there are two scripture passages. And the first one is from the book of Acts. But before we dive into the word, let us prepare ourselves with prayer. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, we come before you ever earnestly seeking your guidance. So may we put aside our distractions and be led by the power of your word. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Our first scripture passage is from... Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Listen now for what the Spirit of God has to say to us, the people of God. After this, Paul left Ath Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was, of what, he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. The second reading comes from Paul's letter back to the city of Corinth. After he spent time there and had moved on, uh, he wrote back a letter when he heard about some troubles and some conflict in the church in Corinth. So listen now for the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 10 through 18. Paul writes, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. 
For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder how Paul found out about Aquila and Priscilla. Were they the friends of a neighbor he used to pass on his walk down the street to the market every week when he lived back in Tarsus? Or were they the Hebrew school classmates of his sister's husband with whom he had recently connected when they ran into each other unexpectedly in Athens? I'm making these people up, of course, but Paul seemed to have his network. Whenever God called him to a new place in order to teach about Jesus and form a community of faith for those who trust in him, he seemed to find some kind of support, someone who would receive him and encourage him and really minister to him as he was called to minister in a new place. It's a good thing he did. It's a good thing he had some sort of network in which to find a shelter and work and support because in many cases, the task before him was daunting. Few people would have faulted Paul, I imagine, if he had said no each and every time God told him to go. No, thank you. No, because it's really not all that safe. No, because I don't think they'll listen to me. No, because there's no way I have or can make enough money to live along the way. No, because I just don't see how it'll be successful. No, because this really isn't the way we've tried to teach faith before. No, because it might upset people. It might be dangerous. Remember what we heard last week in the Acts of the Apostles. Paul and Cyrus stirred up all sorts of trouble by preaching that the Messiah, Jesus, died and rose again from that death. That his power, his love, his salvation was for all people, not just a few. This proclamation, those who didn't like it said, was turning the world upside down. And that challenged their thinking, their understanding of who is included in God's love, God's covenant. It challenged their position and comfort. And they responded angrily, even violently. And this week, we hear a hint of the trouble with which Priscilla and Aquila were faced as Jewish believers of Jesus in Rome. The emperor, Claudius, another Roman historian tells us, expelled them from the city of Rome for being followers of the Christ, likely for proclaiming Jesus is Lord, not the emperor. The gospel and proclaiming it can get you in trouble. And that makes it easy to start with a no. When new ideas spring up, when change is needed, when our values seem threatened, when our comfort is disrupted, when our position isn't popular, when it requires sacrifice to answer God's call, the no because is right there on the tips of our tongues. Too often it's our default answer, not just individually, but as a body. Too often it's where we start when a new ministry idea is before us or a challenge to our comfort is presented for the sake of the gospel. There are plenty of reasons for Paul to say no because when he was uprooted and jailed or called in a new direction. But Paul chose a different response. Knowing that he had been called to share the story of God's grace beyond the Jewish family, knowing this mission was at the core of God's desire for him and for others, Paul chose instead, yes, 
how? And then the pieces fell into place. Aquila and Priscilla had recently come to Corinth to escape persecution as followers of Jesus. Likely they too needed the support and extra help making ends meet. A common trade, tent making, set them all up for better business. And a synagogue was already established where holy arguments about scripture and faith gave Paul the opportunity to talk about his experience as an apostle of Jesus. Acknowledging God's call and leading and desire with a yes, then pursuing the answer with the resources available with a how, opened the doors for the good news to be shared. Yes, how brought new life, faithful ministry, and gave birth to the church. I wonder if we can think of some yes, how moments in the life of our own church. And actually, I invite you and encourage you, if you want to type a few in the chat, you're welcome to do that. I'm just going to lift up a couple of very recent ones. What about our desire to continue to support local businesses during this economic crisis brought upon by the pandemic? Our yes, how turned into more Easter lily purchases and therefore more support of our local nursery than we have seen in years. Even moving to online worship, either recorded or live, where we may have to stay longer than any of us would like to. Even that is a yes, how when we could have said no, because people won't want to try this new technology. No, because it will never be the same as gathering together in person. No, because communion doesn't count unless we're all in the same room. Answering yes, how to God's call is what keeps the church alive and faithful to Jesus, whose whole mission and ministry, whose life, death, and resurrection was a big yes, how, to God's desire to love all of creation. By the time Paul writes his letter back to the church at Corinth, whose founding we heard about in Acts, it sounds like maybe the yes, how spirit has been lost a little bit. Paul knows more about what was going on than we do, only hearing one half of the conversation, of course. But somehow it seems that this church he founded some years ago is now caught up in disagreements and divisions. There are quarrels among the children of God and a picking of teams or choosing of sides. Everyone is lining up behind their favorite preacher and using these alliances as reasons to stand against each other. Their human-made divisions are causing a spiritual problem, the fracturing of the children of God. Friends, one of the biggest fractures among God's children in our country, in our society, one of our biggest spiritual problems is the sin of racism. A homemade cell phone video from Brunswick, Georgia brought that sin to the front of the minds of many comfortable people, many white people, I have to say, who had no idea that Ahmad Arbery, a 25-year-old black man, was killed while out on a jog on February 23rd, and that his known killers had not yet been arrested two and a half months later. But this sin of racism, it's always at the front of the minds of people who have to worry about whether going for a jog or playing in the park, or resting in their own homes, or driving with a burnt out taillight will get them killed 
today. The sin of racism is a sin of deep seated division with origins far older than any of us, but with ramifications and manifestations that are no less present now than they were generations ago. Racism is more than any one person's words or actions that we can denounce and move on from. Racism is embedded in and woven into, supported by the very structure of our society, a society that thrives on keeping people separated in good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods. Working class and upper class, urban and suburban, rich and poor, immigrant and American, white and black and brown. It's a sin that has meant the prevalence of COVID-19 among the Latino community in Illinois is three times higher than the state average. It's a sin revealed by the disparities in health care and wellness that have led to rates of death among Latinos with COVID-19 in New York City to be 50% higher than those of whites, 100% higher, double for African Americans. It's a sin propped up and perpetuated by the denial that some people move through this country with more ease than others simply because of the tone of their skin. And many of us don't want that to change because it means giving up some of the benefits we receive, whether we asked for them or not, because we are white. It's a sin that is killing us all as it drives us to seek only what is good for ourselves, not what is good for others and for creation itself. It's a sin of human-made divisions. It has the Reverend Jan Edmiston, former co-moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA, often says, it breaks God's heart. It makes Jesus cry. Confronting the sin of racism, dismantling its structures individually, as a church, as a community, as a nation, has got to be a priority for Christians who proclaim a gospel of love, freedom from oppression, and reconciliation. People's lives depend on it. And not just the lives of people of color, but also the lives of people who move through the world with white privilege as well. It is one of the three priorities of the Matthew 25 vision that has been cast for our denomination. It has been an important topic of learning and discipleship for some in our congregation. But we have to keep going. In the face of every no because we may think up, it has to become one of our yes hows. The how is, of course, the hard part. And I can't wrap up this sermon with a quick and easy list of how to end racism, or it probably would have already happened. It's as much a problem and a sin for me as it is for anyone who benefits from its existence. But I've been trying to learn a thing or two or three from friends and colleagues and others who are willing to teach and who are taking up this important work. I'll share a few of them. We who believe ourselves to be white or who benefit from the idea of whiteness, we need to listen to and believe the accounts of racism experienced by people of color. We need to spend as much or more time teaching our children not to kill those who are different from them as people of color are spending teaching their children how not to get killed. We need to let go of the belief that we know best what people of color need and start listening 
to what people of color are saying. And therefore, we need to join their work and prioritize their priorities. Our human divisions, Paul tells us, are healed when God's children are united in mind and purpose. And I give thanks to our faithful God always because of the grace in Christ Jesus that makes that possible. Amen. Having heard the word of God so faithfully preached, let us respond with our yes, how, using these words from the Confession of 1967. Together we say, with an urgency born of hope in God's redeeming work in Jesus Christ, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. It does not identify limited progress with the kingdom of God on earth, nor does it despair in the face of disappointment and defeat. In steadfast hope, the church looks beyond all partial achievement to the final triumph of God. Now by him who by the power within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And now let us come together in prayer. And as we are praying together, I would invite you all, if you have a prayer requests in that chat box, you could do that. And there'll also be a time for you to raise your hands, whether hitting the raise the hand button or hold your hand up there so uh, Pastor Stephanie or Pastor Michelle and I can uh, see your prayer request. But first, let's come together in this word of prayer. Holy and healing God, we give thanks for the many ways you have inspired us to live in unity as your church during these difficult times. We give thanks for connections made over the distances and the opportunities given us to care for our neighbors and for all of creation during this time. Still, we know that unity is not always present in our lives. We pray for all those areas where our relationships need to be brought into alignment with your will and your love demonstrated through Christ Jesus. We pray for relationships between spouses and partners, within families in the church, with coworkers and neighbors, and with those with whom we have differences. Loving God, please heal wounds that are still open or those that are continually reopened. We pray for the family of Ahmad Arbery, and all those who suffer because of the sin of racism present in our society. May your spirit of counsel and understanding work within us that we may dig in and do the tough work of being an anti-racist people and an anti-racist congregation, working to confront injustice within, within ourselves and throughout our community and within this nation. Holy God, be with those among our community who are hurting because of separation, isolation, anxiety, and fear. We pray for all those who are working long and difficult hours in grocery stores, at hospitals on the road, or from home. We pray for all those who worry in this present time because of lack of employment. We pray for all those making decisions for the health and well being of all during these pandemic days. And holy God, during this time, we also lift up Charlie Kallstrom and his, pray for his family and the doctors and the medical professionals that surround him and give him the care he needs. We also lift up in prayer Jim, Jenny, and Morgan Cole, who are recovering from injuries from a car accident. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also pray for all those who are grieving especially in this time when physical presence and connection are not possible. We lift up Kristen Williams and her family on the death of her father, Bob Lindahl and his family on the unexpected death of his sister, and Jim Call on the death of his mother. Comforting God, bring hope in times of loss and help us to be comforters of all who grieve. 
Help us to live, love, and worship together that we may understand one another and care for one another as we work together in your mission field. And as we care for one another, let us now offer up our own prayers at this time, whether in the chat box or aloud as we raise our hands and share the hopes and concerns that weigh on our hearts and minds. Our prayers uh, for extended family of Don and Judy Coates, for 20-year-old Sydney who fell off of a roof and she may have head trauma, for TJ who's awaiting a knee surgery but has now broken his other foot. We pray for healing. For continued prayers for 25-year-old Kyle who seems to be in a better place than he was last week but needs our continued prayers for his depression. We also lift up Tom's mother and all those who are living in assisted living areas um, who need that hope, who need that healing, and for the staff who care for them during this tough time. We offer up prayers for David Beasley, or Laurel O'Brien's brother, who's having knee surgery tomorrow, and for the doctors that they'll be able to do this. Harrison. Prayers for my cousin, Phil Schneider, uh, who's into treatment for pancreatic cancer and uh, working through chemo. We hear that prayer and we say, Lord have mercy and Lord be with Harrison's cousin. Loving God, we give you thanks for mothers during this time and mother-like figures. We give you thanks for them on this Mother's Day, those who mentor, guide, and shepherd others. From Scott. Let's better try to listen, not with the intent to reply, but with the intent to genuinely understand. We pray for all those who find this day difficult, uh, who struggle with ideas of motherhood, who have had difficult relationships with or as mothers, with those who struggle with pressures placed on them by society or family and friends. We pray for our siblings in Christ, Fruto, Davida. May they be safe, God, and that their ministry continue to thrive and make connections. Many are our hopes and prayers, O oh God. Hear them all and hear our souls when we do not know the words to pray. But in unity, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
after our charge and benediction, our postlude will be a slideshow, actually, set to music that uh, Brock and Ruthann put together for the uh, local garden club. It has signs of spring, signs of hope, and you're all invited to uh, share that, see that, enjoy that uh, as we close. And then during that prelude, if you'd like, or, or postlude, or if you'd like to hang around a little bit afterwards, we're going to try and provide some time to chat. We'll do that during using the chat box. If it's a very large group, if you want to give greetings to anybody, feel free to do so. Um, and if it's a little smaller group or we're trying to feel like we want to experiment, we can maybe unmic folks and give each other a chance to chat. And it's, it's easier with smaller numbers uh, to take turns and, and talk to each other. And so we'll try to facilitate that as best we can. But for now, using Paul's own words, I appeal to you, I appeal to us all siblings in faith, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of us will be in agreement and that there will be no divisions among us, that we will be united in the same mind and the same purpose. And as we go, may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.